Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. It is Wednesday morning, April 6th, 2022. And we are going to finish the book of Colossians today. It seems like this has been rather um, disjointed, let's say, because of issues being out of town and then some internet issues. Um, we're going to finish it today. We're in Colossians chapter 4, and we're going to start here in just a second in verse 7 of chapter 4. Let's see who we got here so far. We've got several joining on. Hey, let's see. Debbie, Gail, Brian, Sheila. Good morning, guys. Connie, good morning. Diana, Lyle, good to see you. And, of course, we're cross-posted onto the Near Churches page. We usually have some viewers over there, too. All right, and there is Mark and Annette. Good to see you guys. Colossians chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse 7. This is his conclusion, you might say, some final greetings. And it's always interesting to me to read these greetings. I think sometimes these particular sections are kind of treated like the... Um, kind of like the genealogies of the Old Testament, kind of skipped over them. You know, what do these names mean to me? Well, it's kind of interesting to pay attention, not necessarily to the names themselves, but what these people mean to Paul and, and sometimes some of the issues that he has with some of them um, based on their behavior, perhaps. Hey, Laura, good to see you. So that's where we're going to start, Colossians 4 and verse 7. And again, we're going to finish this today. And then the plan is for tomorrow morning at 11, we're going to start a study of the book of 1 Corinthians. And of course, we're not going to start right into chapter 1. We're going to lay some groundwork, look at some history of Corinth, and um, particularly Paul's uh, time there as recorded in the book of Acts. That's always a good way to start when you study a book of the New Testament, or a letter of the New Testament. Where can I find its uh, this congregation's origin in the book of Acts, and what connections does it have to... to uh, either Paul or some other apostle or worker in the first century. So that's the plan for beginning tomorrow. Good morning, Wayne. Good to see you. All right, Colossians 4 and verse 7. So he doesn't, there are different times. Well, like the book of Romans, Romans chapter 16, he mentions, man, I don't know how many people there, but um, a lot more than he mentions here. <clears throat> Tychicus is the first individual he mentions. Uh, we read of Tychicus five times. Uh, in, in the New Testament, and Paul refers to him as a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. And what Tychicus is going to do is he's going to tell the church at Colossae about everything Paul's been through. Obviously, we didn't need to know it because it didn't, it didn't get written down for us, and he's just letting them know in this letter, he's coming and he's going to tell you um, all the news about me. I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. So that's all we know about that. But you notice the, the language that Paul uses describing these individuals, um, and specifically here, Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant. Um, you know, one, one person that I think of, and he's actually mentioned in this text, Barnabas. This takes me back to Acts chapter uh, what is it, Acts chapter 4, where we learn that Barnabas was the son of encouragement. You know, we all need, you, you Christi as a Christian, I have influence on those around me, but I'm also influenced by those around me. And as a Christian, I need people in my life like this, all of us do, who are beloved. Okay, you have an emotional attachment to these people, your brothers and sisters in Christ, they're faithful ministers, okay? And, and Paul talks about those who ministered to him. That word minister just means to serve or to attend. Um, taking care of one another, you might say. A faithful minister and a fellow servant. We're working together as ministers, but we're all servants in the Lord. And we all need that. We need that encouragement. Sometimes we need that rebuke um, that our fellow Christians can offer us. Well, obviously Tychicus was a great helper of Paul. Verse 9, with Onesimus. Onesimus is only mentioned twice in your New Testament here in, in the book of Philemon. But he is also a faithful and beloved brother. It's exactly what he said of Tychicus. And he says, who is one of you? So it tells us where he is from. 
He is from Colossae. They will make known to you all things which are happening here, happening where Paul is, uh, in prison. Aristarchus, verse 10, he's mentioned five times in the New Testament. My fellow prisoner greets you. Uh, Paul, you know, Paul spent a lot of time behind bars, you might say, um, under arrest, uh, on trial. So he has these people, you know, he has these traveling companions. Luke was one of his traveling companions. He, he come, Luke comes out in this text too, but Paul was not alone. We need to remember that. He was oftentimes not alone in these difficult situations that he found himself in, particularly when you look at the book of Acts. Like, for instance, Acts chapter 16, when he went to Philippi, he and Silas were together. They were arrested and jailed together. So he's mindful of those people. Well, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark. Mark is mo- the most prominent of all these individuals mentioned here in um, Colossians 4. Mark is the most prominent in the New Testament. He's mentioned a couple times, three or four times in the book of Acts, mentioned eight times total in the New Testament. And when you read Acts 15, you see that Paul and Barnabas separated They split ways because they disagreed on who they should take with them. Paul took Silas. Barnabas took John Mark. Well, we learn here, perhaps, why Barnabas took John Mark at that point in time, because they were family. Well, Paul and Barnabas disagreed on that, but they went their separate ways, and they they both continued their work in the Lord, as, again, as recorded there at the end of Acts chapter 15. I think it's like verses 36 to 40. But later on in his life, talking about Mark here, at the end of his life, in fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I think it's verse 11, as Paul's sitting in prison in Rome, he says to Timothy, um, bring Mark because he's useful to me and to the ministry. So Paul had a change of heart towards him over time. The cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, this is the only time this individual is mentioned in the New Testament, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision, Jewish. They have proved to be a comfort to me. So again, that's that's what I was kind of saying earlier. It's interesting to notice these closings of Paul's letters because he talks about these people who are fellow workers, fellow ministers, beloved, and sometimes, as is the case here, fellow prisoners, they're a comfort to me. And again, as Christians even today, and of course we understand Paul going through what he went through, he needed that comfort, but you know, we need that comfort too. Life is not perfect. There, we, we all go through different things, and we need our Christian family. And so that, that's one of the things that I pick up from, from these closings. Epaphras, verse 12. He's only mentioned three times in your New Testament. Who is one of you, again, he's from Colossae, a bondservant of Christ greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Now remember, one of the things I told you about Colossians was is that one of the main words is the word all. It's used over 30 times in these four chapters. And um, as Paul is talking about this individual here, Epaphras, He's praying for them. Again, we have this word, that they may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. It would be comforting to this church in Colossae, who is facing persecution from Jewish sources, from Gnostic sources, from uh, from asceticism, you know, people who, who say that you should deny the body to have a better spirit. All of this mixture of false teaching that they were being influenced by, it would comfort this church to know that there's somebody from them who is praying for them. And again, we all need that. We need that encouragement. And we need those prayers, too, by the way. You remember back up from yesterday, back in chapter 4, in um, verses 2 and 3, talking about them telling them to tarry in prayer, and especially praying for him, for Paul himself, we all need that. <clears throat> he says, For I bear him witness, verse 13, uh, that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. If you were to look at a biblical map, Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis, it's like we today we call it like the Tri-City. It's something like that, very uh, 
very tight region of these areas. Um, Christians throughout, obviously. Well, Epaphras is zealous for all those people. He's praying for them, and that would be comforting to them. Luke, verse 14. Luke, obviously, is prominent. He wrote the book of Luke. He wrote the book of Acts. Now, by name, he's only mentioned twice in the New Testament, but we're familiar, obviously, with him. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Now, at this point in time, Demas is, you might say, positively spoken of by Paul. Now, let's see, I think it's in 2 Timothy 4. You get to 2 Timothy 4. Let me see here. Um... Hmm. I thought it was 2 Timothy 4. Demas hath forsaken... Okay, yeah, 2 Timothy 4, 9. Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. So, obviously, then Colossians predates his letter, second letter to Timothy. Luke was his... Luke was one of Paul's travel companions. Since Luke wrote the book of Acts... Um, you have these sections, and they start in Acts chapter 16, where you'll be reading the book of Acts, and Luke starts using this word, we. We went here. We did this. We saw this. Well, that's Luke. And so he's a um, fellow traveler and teacher of God's Word with Paul. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphus, and the church that is in his house. And, of course, that's a very common thing that we see in the New Testament, what we refer to as house churches. Congregations didn't have church buildings like we have today. They met in people's homes, or perhaps they met in open areas. You know, the, the early church there in Jerusalem met in the temple area. And so sometimes it was an open-air meeting, as we might say. Debbie says, when someone helps us, it can be such an encouragement. Sometimes others don't understand how much it means and helps the one who is needing help. Yeah, and, and here's another thing. Not only helping those who need it, and of course that's a, that's a principle of New Testament Christianity. Um, you know, I think of Matthew 25 where Jesus talks about, as, in as much as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. But when you reach out to help someone, it does help you too. Now, that's not why we do it, obviously. It's not just for self-gratification, let's say. But it does. It has an effect on you when you step out and help others. It's interesting. I've seen this so many times in the church where that kind of thing happens. And it's like people are surprised at, well, that helped me. I, I turned... I, called this person, or I visited this person, it, it, it encouraged me when I did that. And that's the way of it. You know, that's the way of edific mutual edification. We build each other up. Um, Paul, just thinking here, Paul, back in Galatians chapters 4 and 5, he talks about the church there, and he talks about them biting and devouring one another, and that they could become consumed of one another. And I've seen that in churches where it's like you get to the building and there's tension that, as we say, the tension is so thick you could cut it with a knife. Uh, I've seen places like that. And I suppose we've all experienced things like that. And that's not good. That's not the way it's supposed to be. You know, we're supposed to be, we're supposed to edify one another and seek things which make for peace. Romans 14 uh, that's about verse nine, 18 or 19 in Romans chapter 14. So many times we can get selfish and self-centered. And um, I've seen people leave congregations and move to other congregations because the church wasn't doing anything for them, supposedly. And I know very well, you know, it's, it's part, of the, part of the nature of the work of a preacher. You know a lot of things that other people don't know, that other people in the congregation don't know. And I've seen folks leave congregations because they say, well, the church doesn't do anything for me. And most of the time, that complaint comes from those who are doing nothing. They want the attention. And if they're not getting it, they'll leave and they'll go somewhere else and do just as little there as they did when, where they left from. So we need to be careful um, with our... With our uh, with our motivations, with what we do and why we do them. But 
also be careful in the fact that it's not just you who needs encouraged. We all do. And so we need to think about that. All right. Uh, Colossians 4.16. Now, when this, this is so interesting to me here. Now, when this epistle is read among you, church at Colossae, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans. Okay, you pass it on. What I'm writing to you, pass it to the church. One of the things that shows me is that there were multiple copies of these New Testament documents. Another verse that talks about that is in the very next book, 1 Thessalonians 5. Uh, listen to verse 27. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. There were circulating, there were copies of these letters circulating throughout the first century. Um, perhaps you've heard people say something along the lines of, well, those church, the church in the first century didn't have all the New Testament. Yes, they did. Now, they may not have had a leather-bound King James Version, but they had the apostolic writings circulating. They had the apostles themselves who were traveling around writing. Um, John, for instance, in 1 John chapter 2, as he's talking to those Christians, he says, you have, the King James uses this word unction. I don't like that word. The word is anointing. You have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. Not only did they have the letters and the apostles themselves, but they had spiritual gifts. And one of those spiritual gifts was the gift of knowledge, and another one was the gift of wisdom. So we can't say that they didn't have the total New Testament in the first century. That's just not true. Um, so anyway, I see that here in Colossians 4.16. But here's a second thing I see. All right, listen to it again. When this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans. Truth doesn't change from congregation to congregation. The gospel doesn't change from, from this city to this city, from location to location. Whatever is the truth in Colossae is the truth in Laodicea. And so whatever is the truth in Mammoth Spring is the truth in, um, well, I have a viewer that watches from Uganda and Africa. Truth doesn't change. And so you guys read that letter, pass it on to Laodicea, and that you likewise read the, read the epistle from Laodicea. So they have a letter. You read that letter in Colossae. Truth is truth regardless of where you live. All right? That, so Colossians 4.16 is, it really says a lot there. And say, to, uh, and say to Archippus, he's only mentioned twice in the New Testament, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. So apparently he's working there in the church at Colossae. This salutation by my own hand, Paul, remember my chains, grace be with you, amen. Now that's an interesting ending there, the salutation by my own hand. Over in 2 Thessalonians 3, in verse 17, he says this, The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. When Paul wrote a letter, he put his name to it. So... There's often a lot of discussion about who wrote the book of Hebrews. Paul didn't sign it. Paul didn't write it. So that's just a bit of information. All right, let's see here. We've got a couple comments. Uh, let's see. Diana says, This study we do together reminds me of that too. This is such an encouragement to me and to all of us together. You know, thank you, Diana. This is, this is part of what I do here at Mammoth Spring. This is not all the work I do. But it's something I, I take time to do. I enjoy it, and it helps me in my personal study and my personal knowledge. And I want it to help others, too. Um, Debbie says, when we help others, it also helps us. I feel that when I help someone, that it helps me so very much also. Yeah, there's, again, mutual edification. Lottie, good to see you on here today. All right, guys, that's the book of Colossians. And like I said, it's been a bit disjointed, more than, more than our past studies, and I... I guess I apologize for that, but there wasn't really anything I could do about it. So, anyway, good to see all of you on here today. Yeah, Connie, it helps us all to grow, and we all need that. Good to see you here today. Be back here tomorrow at 11 o'clock, and we will start a study of 1 Corinthians. I'm looking, and I know I'm kind of jumping. We could move on into 1 Thessalonians, but no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to start 1 Corinthians tomorrow. I was thinking about the things that I've done. I've done the Gospels, and Acts, and Romans. And for some reason, I went from Romans to Galatians. So, there you go. All right, guys, I hope you have a good day. And tonight at Mammoth Spring, if you're unable to get out, we are going to be doing an overview of the book of Zechariah. Zechariah 
one way I've described that, that's the revelation of the Old Testament. So we're going to look at, do an overview of that book tonight. All right, guys, hope you have a good day and hope to see you back here tomorrow at 11 o'clock.